Hi, Ken. <laughs> hey. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having tried me. I tried to decorate my background a little bit, but I have to go like this to get both back. Gotta, I have to show you something, though. There are only like three of these, and I have one of them. What the hell is that? It's Where'd you get that? It's a jacket that someone made for me with the Volt the, Volt, the EP t-shirt that I had on the back of it. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that. Yeah, I do. So, so you grew up in Ipswich? Uh, well, I grew up in Miami, but I spent my summers in Ipswich until I was 15. Oh, okay. So then, you're not, then I moved to Ipswich. Oh, so you're not originally a Mass guy. You're a Florida guy. Yeah. I mean, I was born in Massachusetts. And uh, when I was uh, about two and a half, three years old, my mom and I moved to Miami. Now, were you really a clam shucker? Or is that just the Curtis Casella story that, that he made up? I was a clam shucker. You were? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not as always sure if Curtis is pulling my leg or not. Because yeah, yeah, me, me too. And, uh, and, and the first thing you started doing um, was Iron Cross? Yeah. T talk about the early days and how you got started. Uh, well, how I got started was um, I got really into rock music, you know, like starting to buy records and things like that. When I was about 10 years old, um, my dad had a pretty cool record collection. And uh, every summer when I was in Ipswich, I'd check out his record collection. And uh, at the age of 10, for some reason, I got really obsessed with it. And uh, he had some Stones records and that became like my favorite band of all time, the Rolling Stones, you know, when I was that age. And uh, that made me want to learn how to play guitar. You know, I, I thought someday maybe I could be in the Rolling Stones. <laughs> so was Keith your favorite? Uh, yeah, Keith, Keith is uh, not anymore. But uh, back then, when he was younger, yeah, he was definitely my favorite. And was Iron Cross the first band that you formed? Was that actually with the two Pats as well? Or was that different? No, that? no that was... Um, I was in a cover band um, when I had been playing guitar for about three months in Miami. You know, we yeah. knew like 10 songs and played a couple parties and that was the extent of it. Um, but when I was uh, 15 years old, I got into this band with these two brothers, Mark and John Norris in Ipswich. Okay. And, uh, you know, I told my mom, hey, can I go to school in Ipswich and stay in this band? You know, I'm, I'm really having fun and everything because uh, I live with my grandparents in Ipswich, you know, during, okay. the, summer, during the summertime. So, uh, you know, she said, yeah, I mean, I was I was getting into a lot of trouble in Miami as a youngster. So uh, and I was pretty well behaved in Ipswich with my grandparents. So uh, it seemed like a no brainer for everything, you know, getting to play music and staying out of out of trouble, so to speak. Kind of a mellow community up there, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Iron Cross was the first band that you were in? Yeah. yeah. Besides first, the cover band. Original band. You know, um, we, we had about 12 or 14 songs. And uh, we, were, we were together uh, about a year. And uh, there was a, a fire at their house and they both died. So, uh, what? That, that was, yeah, they um, they had a fire at their house. Their father died, and Mark and John died. Oh, I'm sorry, big... man. I was not expecting to hear that. I didn't hear about that. That's that's horrible. Yeah, it was it was terrible. Real real big family, really loved by the community of Ipswich, and uh, so it was a big big tragedy uh, all around. And uh, so, you know, I. All, all my equipment was destroyed. We used to practice over at their house. All of our equipment was destroyed in the fire. And uh, a couple months after the fire, um, Mrs. Norris, El Eleanor Norris, uh, got in touch with me and said, you know, I want to take you to a music store and replace your equipment. Wow. You know, I, I got an insurance check uh, for what happened. So she, uh, she and I drove into Boston 
to Wurlitzer's and uh, she bought me a Les Paul and a Music Man amp, which was uh, way nicer than what I had, um, you know, before the fire. And, uh, you know, I kept going then. And I knew Pat Leonard from, mm -hmm. from Moving Targets because he actually, he did lights for a couple of gigs that, that uh, Iron Cross did. Like built his own light show out of like, uh, my, my grandmother was, uh, she worked uh, at the cafeteria at Ipswich High School. So he got like all these huge, like tomato cans and stuff and, and put lights in them and built poles and everything. It was pretty cool. And uh, so Pat, Pat, you know, and I were still hanging out and he said, you know, don't, don't stop playing, you know, why don't you teach me how to play bass? So uh, that summer, you know, we spent a lot of time together just at his house. He bought a Guild guitar and just with four strings. And uh, we listened to The Clash and The Sex Pistols. And, you know, he got into punk rock then, which is really cool for, for all of us. And, uh, you know, that's really where Moving Targets started. I think I think a lot of people will say what I'm going to say right now. The first time I heard the band was the bands that could be God compilation that was uh, Gerard put out. That yeah. was the first time I think I heard the band. I was working at Enigma Records. It was 1984, I believe. Right. Yeah, you're 84. right. And that was the first time I heard the band. And then before you know it, you guys ended up with uh, Curtis <laughs> and Tang. Yeah. And then you did, you were with Curtis for a lot of records, not just uh, moving targets, but solo records. Um, let's go back to the um, bur um, Burning and Water record seems to be the one that, you know, I don't know, it's regarded by most people as the best, uh, most popular moving targets record. You worked with Lou Giordano, who's like yes. a legend. What was that all like? And, uh, and that was, would you agree with great. the and would you agree with the assessment that that is the most popular record as well? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one everyone cites. You know, I think it's um, you know, it was our debut record. We were it was just the right time for us to do that, and uh, the right batch of songs, the right producer and Lou Giordano, and uh, and the right label with Tang. You know, Tang was starting to happen at that point, and so we uh, we got a lot of good reviews on that. People used to always say it was kind of like Husker Du meets Mission of Burma. I mean, would that be a good way to describe that band in the early days? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are two of um, you know, as a, as a songwriter in the band, those were two of my influences: Mission of Burma, uh, The Clash, Husker Du, uh, The Damned stuff like that. Um, I know that you spent some time with Dread Fool in the Den, Peter Prescott. Was, yeah. was that a simultaneous thing that was going on with the moving targets at that time? Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, I, I joined Dread Fool in the Den in 1983. Um, I mean, okay, it's so before the, before the yeah. uh, conflict compilation came out. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, Moving targets are to thank for, for me getting into Dreadful in the Den. Uh, at the time, uh, Dan Ireton, the singer of the band and songwriter. Okay. Uh, he, he was working at Rocket Records in Saugus. Do you remember that? Of course. Al Quint's one of my good friends, man. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he was working there and um, we had just like a week before I was, I was in the store with a friend of mine. And uh, the week before we had just played our first gig with the Bad Brains and Scream at CBGB's. What a first gig. Yeah, I know. All downhill from there. <laughs> but uh, so uh, I was flipping through the new releases and uh, Scream's first record, you know, which had just come out maybe a couple months before or something was there. And I said, hey, here's that band Scream we played with. And Dan overheard me say that. And he's like, you played with Scream? And, and I said, yeah, I'm in this band Moving Targets. We played with them at CBGB's last week and we started talking about music and stuff. So uh, I gave them uh, a rehearsal tape cassette that I had in my car of Moving Targets and uh, he gave me uh, his first single, So Tough, Sanctuary and So Tough. 
and uh, he said, you know, we're going to be doing some gigs and we need another guitar player. You know, you want to check this out? Maybe you're interested, you know, just like out of nowhere. You know, he didn't know me from a hole in the wall. So uh, that's how I got into Dreadful in the Din. Wow. I mean, I, I, I didn't even, I didn't even like the single. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I, I mean, I like it now, but at, at, I, was, I was too young to like really appreciate it. Um, but you played with Peter Prescott. That had to be yeah. kind of cool, huh? Yeah, and it was, it was the Mission of Burma guys. I mean, they had just broken up, you know, less than a year before, but they were still uh, doing Dread Fool stuff. We, we did a couple of shows, and the first uh, Boston show was Moving Targets, Dread Fool in the Den, Christmas and the Proletariat at the Channel. Wow, you were on some pretty good bills, man. Yeah. <laughs> man, the two you just mentioned. <laughs> how did, going back to that CBGB gig, how did that all happen? Do you well, remember? <laughs> big Bad Brains fan. I forgot to mention Bad Brains were a big influence, especially like the stuff that's on the ba Bands Could Be God compilation. Right. You know, it's kind of like hardcore. Um, uh, Pat Brady and Pat Leonard and I used to go see the Bad Brains whenever they were around. And they were playing uh, at the living room in Providence, Rhode Island. So uh, I had this idea uh, to meet the Bad Brains. Like I had a big old bag of weed and I rolled uh, this giant joint. And we got backstage and introduced ourselves and said, hey, you guys want to get high and stuff? And so they said, sure. So we smoked it up and uh, their manager was there, Anthony. Oh, yeah. And I said, man, you know, we're real big fans of, of the Bad Brains. We'd love to open up for you guys sometime. And uh, I gave him a, a rehearsal cassette. And he gave me his card and said, you know, give me a call in a couple of weeks. So uh, we called him up a couple of weeks later. And he said, uh, yeah, I lost the cassette. Sorry. And so I said, can we play for you over the phone? And he said, sure, why not? So like we got off the phone with him and went over to Pat Brady's house and like his mom held the phone up and we played pay to come over the phone yeah. for him. Wow. <laughs> Cause we, we did like a bunch of bad brain songs. We, you know, before we did originals, we did like all punk rock cover songs. And uh, so we got the gig. He said, yeah, you got the gig a hundred bucks. And it was, it was you even got paid. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Paid. It was Christmas Eve too. <laughs> Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Yeah, it's when they did the three night stand in eight in uh, in 82. It's, yeah. it's on like a video, a commercially released video. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. That's yeah. legendary right there. Yeah. Like SSD That's Control played with them on Sunday night. Uh, Scream and, and the Targets played with them on Friday night. And I forget who played with them. Uh, uh, Antidote and someone else on Saturday night. Wow. Yeah um that's in, that's incredible man um before i i'm gonna keep it rolling here because there's so there's so much stuff that you've done man i mean i was looking at your discography and i'm like ah um before i bring up bull la volta i'm sure that you you heard about the passing of bill whale and yes that's Very that sad, must have that must have been a bummer man for you huh yeah yeah we were actually uh the guys and myself, we we're on tour. We just got off a tour last week. Yeah. A three week tour. And uh, I, I got a message from Jay Robbins from Jawbox that, that Todd Phillips, the drummer, was trying to get in touch with me. He didn't have my number. So uh, I, I uh, got Todd's number from, from Jay and called him up. But in, in the message, it said there was some bad news. So, you know, I, I knew something was up. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was a real shocker. Everyone in town that uh, I'm back up here now, everyone that heard about that was just talking about it. It's just, I only met, like, I only met you in passing, really, at Bolt La because I used to go to a lot of Bolt La Volta shows. Uh, I'm pretty sure when I saw, I mean, I know I saw you in Boston, but I'm pretty sure I saw you when you were with the band in New York and LA as well, because yeah. that whole era around that time, which I was going to talk about. Um, Kurt, so Curtis told me that simul simultaneously, this is the way he told it to me, you left the moving targets. Um, 
Let me see if I can get this right. You left the moving targets. Corey Luke Brennan joined the Lemonheads. The, the targets broke up. You joined Bull of Volta and Corey Luke Brennan joined the Lemonheads all simultaneous. Is that true? Uh, my recollection, uh, that wouldn't be simultaneously. I think uh, Cor Corey left Bull of Volta because uh, he had to study full time. The priest and, a professor uh, now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the and he, he came to the show in Boston. It was good to see him. I hadn't seen him in like 30 years. So, uh, oh, that's cool. He, when you played, yeah, it, he, well. he brought, he brought his daughter. It was his daughter's first punk rock show seeing wow. uh, Field Day and Moving Targets. Good show. And Lenny Lashley as well. Um, but uh, I, I think Corey joining the Lemonheads was just when uh, they booked their tour in Europe, the Bolt of Volta Lemonheads tour. Um, I don't think he joined like right after he left Bolt of Volta. You know, there's probably a few months there uh, where he was just doing his studies and stuff. Yeah, I knew that sounded That's too. I guess too. <laughs> it sounded too good to be. <laughs> well, not too good, but too coincidental. So was he? Uh, he was. Go did they seek you? Did Did Evan and those guys seek you right away? I mean, uh, Evan, <laughs> uh, Kurt, Yucky, and those guys. Did they seek you right away? Uh, no, I I sought them out. Um, you know, I, I'd seen Bolt of Volta a couple times. I really liked him. And, uh, you know, as you said, the moving targets uh, had, were doing one of their breakups. And uh, I went and saw them uh, downtown. They played some bar in downtown Boston. I forget where it is, like a place where you, it's not like a club, they, but they rented it out and had uh, Bolt of Volta play. And, uh, you know, that's when I was talking maybe to Kurt or something. And he said, yeah, Corey's leaving the band. We're going to be looking for another guitar player. And I said, I'd like to try out. So uh, Kurt gave me, uh, they had this like eight song or nine song cassette out. The gun didn't know I was loaded. I don't oh, know yeah, yeah. That. I think Matador ended up re-releasing that, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. So he gave me that and I learned the songs and uh, just went to one rehearsal and, you know, I knew the songs pretty well. So I got the job. Were you in the band when they were in the Rumble? Yes. Yeah, I was a judge the night you guys won. <laughs> okay. It was at the Paradise, right? Yeah. Yes. I remember seeing that show and thinking, this band is going to be huge, man. I loved you guys. And then the gift after when you after that, when you made the gift album, just an absolutely fantastic. I found my demo cassette advanced cassette of that not demo but the advanced cassette uh -huh. of it yeah i got a lot of bolt and bolt this stuff because i was like a really huge fan even though i was working for other labels and with other bands i always i actually wrote reviews about bolt and Volta magazines when i wrote for different magazines i wrote for industrial metal magazine and a few others and i didn't always use my own name but because i was working for labels and it was yeah a little bit of a conflict um Things happened really fast for that band after you guys put the gift out. And maybe you can kind of explain to me the whole debacle that was RCA Records, because I'm not sure I really understand. And I was at Metal Blade Records when they reached out to us and asked us. That's when I had that jacket made I showed you yeah. um, if we could help, because they basically said, we don't know what to do with this band. Is yeah. that how you guys well felt? Yeah, what I remember is um, uh, this guy Richard signed the band. I, I can't remember his last name, but he's a guy that uh, had been in the music business for years and years. Like, you know, he'd seen the Stooges, Iggy and the Stooges and stuff like that. I mean, he was a guy who was a real rock and roll fan. And uh, at the time, you know, he might have been in his 50s, but he was working for RCA. So he... Um, I guess he I guess he saw Bolt of Volta play somewhere in New York uh, and and contacted us. And he was a, a big champion of the band. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he got pushed out of the label um, by around the time the, the gift was put out. And so uh, after that, we had like new people to deal with, and they really didn't 
you know, is this a metal band? Is it a punk band? You know, what are we dealing with here? What audience uh, are we marketing this to? It's kind of weird because I can I, I knew what was going on from a behind the scenes perspective because I was at Metal Blade Records when we got the call. I was the director of marketing there. When we got yeah. the call about Bull Volta, I, I was going crazy. I was like, what? Bull Volta? And it was like a lot of people thought that we signed Bull Volta, but we didn't. We just basically marketed that record. Yeah. And here's, here's an interesting sidebar. Jill Kurtz, who's my ex-girlfriend that I went out with for five years, took wow. the photograph. And she told me to say hi to you, by the way. And she yeah. said that you're the oh, one that yeah. asked her to do the photograph for the EP. Um, did I say the name of it? Give Me Danger. Yeah, Give Me Danger. So that's a little sidebar I figured I'd throw in there. So we kind of got handed the band and it was like, can you help us market this? And it was already so convoluted because I don't know what, what our, I understand that the guy liked you guys, but put you guys in a horrible situation, basically, you know, by giving you a deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think Bull of Volta, you know, if it would have happened like two or three years later, it would have been a different story for the band. I think they would have been a lot more successful, but it was kind of a weird time for music. It was right before, you know, Nirvana broke and, and all this stuff. And yeah, that was like 89, 90 or something like that. I believe. Yeah, it was 90. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I saw you guys at the Whiskey, man. You guys were great. I can't, it was three bands, and I can't remember who the other two bands were. It was a package tour. You probably remember. One of them was a New York band. I know that. I, I can't remember right now who the other two bands yeah. were. I have a terrible but, memory for that stuff. <laughs> so um, you spent a few years with Bull LaVolta, and then did you decide that you wanted to go do a solo thing after that? Is that why you moved on from those guys? Uh, not not exactly. Um, when shortly after I joined Bolt Volta, uh, Curtis um, got in touch with me, and and uh, there was a lot of unrecorded moving target songs, and he said, you know, what's the chance of you guys getting back together and recording these songs for Tang? And so uh, I talked to Chuck, you know, who was the bass player of the band at the time. Uh, of that era and Pat Brady and uh and we said sure so um uh, we went to the studio uh Fort Apache with Lou Giordano and just recorded 27 songs yeah there was a lot of crossover when I look at the dates it was like a lot of crossover with the dates I don't know if there it seems like there were Bullet LaVolta and Moving Target records coming out at the same time you know yeah pretty yeah, close right true. yeah and, uh, you know, so we, we did that, the, what the became Brave Noise and Fall, those, uh, the right. second and third record. Um, anyways, jump ahead, um, you know, I'm still on Bolt Volta. We went to Europe uh, with the Lemonheads and that was in 1989. And when we're over there, uh, I met a lot of people that were Moving Targets fans. And so, uh, I talked to a paperclip booking agency who, who booked the Bolt of Volta Lemonheads tour. And I said, what do you think about a moving targets tour? And they said, sure, we'll do it. So uh, when, when I got home, like I told the guys, you want to go on tour? Like, you know, when it's convenient for Bolt of Volta. And uh, so we, we squirreled away a couple of months and, and we rehearsed for like three weeks. And then we uh, went to Europe. Wow. There's a lot of footage, really good footage on YouTube that I've seen in from Europe. Yeah. You know? And uh, I that let me just ask you about that Bull of Volta Lemonheads tour for a second. That must have been a pretty interesting tour to be on. It was a lot of fun. You know, my first time in Europe, uh, any of us, any any of the guys in La Volta was our first time in Europe, as far as I know. Were you close uh, with the Lemonheads guys? Uh, yeah, we were close. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, there, you had Corey, who was, you know, in, right. In Volta Volta, and Jess, Jesse was a super nice guy. And they had the drummer, Mark, who was a nice guy as well. 
I think he only lasted for that tour. Uh, and Evan, you know, Evan's a good dude. It's really funny, you know, uh, one of the guys is a professor, the other one's a director. <laughs> It's yeah. funny how these guys ended up like going in all these different directions, you know, um, yeah. uh, after, after the whole bullet thing and moving targets, you put, I think four solo records out and like a few EPs, um, solo, uh, uh, I put out three solo records, three solo records. Yeah. Over, over the span of like five years. Uh, the first one was uh, Double Negative on City Slang Records in Germany. And uh, that came out in 91. And then uh, uh, I think 94, 95, No Reaction came out on Tang. And then Sin Cigar was the instrumental record came out in, in 96. That's a good record, man. They're all good. But that one right there, that instrumental, I remember that. Yeah. I wish That's I had a copy of that. I don't. But, and you had like... Um, you have you had singles, EPs. You had a lot of, I mean, yeah. you, you put a lot of stuff out. And then I don't know you. Then the 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 record you did in two thousand. Trying to read some of my notes here. Humbucker, uh, that was like a reunion kind of record for Moving Targets. Uh well, first came Wires. Wires, right, right. Yeah, and then Wires, uh, Wires came out in two thousand twenty. Yeah. Or, no, no, excuse me. No, came out in uh, two, 2019, maybe. Yeah, because the Humbucker record, man, I think is fantastic. I asked you before we uh, we started about nice. that song, Apart, man. I, I love that track. It's one of my favorites. So I know I'm jumping all over the place. This is in the tradition of the way I do my interviews, so forgive me. I want to mention for anyone that's listening out there that the Bandcamp stuff that you have, uh, the one called More Lost Songs. Oh my God, there's yeah. so much good material on there. That Dread song, Not the Same, that's what lured yeah. me in. And then I went into the rabbit hole, man. So you put all that stuff up not too yeah. long ago, right? Um, like three or four years ago. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I had a, a bunch of material like that had no home. And, uh, you know, with Bandcamp uh, being such an easy thing to, to deal with. Uh, I love Bandcamp. I, um, I just, uh, I bought some really uh, inexpensive mastering uh, software and just uh, mastered, because a lot of those songs were on cassette. I had to transfer them to, to CD. And uh, the sound quality was, you know, hit or miss on some of the stuff. So mastering it. I uh, made it sound a little better. And uh, I just wanted to have like a box set kind of thing with uh, everything out there. It's really cool, man. songs. Yeah, you, your guitar playing is just, you know, you're a phenomenal guitar player. That's what most people say when you mention Ken Chambers. They're like, what a guitar player. You know, they all freak out. Now, I know that you just did the tour with Moving Targets. And uh, with Field Day, those guys are my buddies because I signed Dag Nasty to, to uh, Giant Records a long time ago. So Pete and Doug, I wasn't around. Otherwise, I would have been at that show at the Middle East. But it was bad timing. The first time they were going out, I had I was going to go see them in Pittsburgh. I was living in Pittsburgh. And then the pandemic fucked everything up, man. Um, but a lot of people are talking about you're going to do a record with Jay Robbins. Did you, did you already start that record? Uh, no, that's going to happen in March, early March. I know Jay, too, because he was in Government Issue and they were on Giant Records as well. Yeah. So Jawbox also. So uh, what's that going to be like? Uh, no idea. I'm, I'm writing the songs uh, as we speak. I've, I've got three months to write a dozen songs, so. So you don't have the songs written. That's no. Cool. First, first time ever in my life I've been in this situation. I've I've always had kind of a back catalog of stuff. So I could, you know, I used to be more prolific than I am now. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, no, just seriously. I mean, I used to write like five songs a week, you know, maybe one good song, four junk songs, but uh, nonetheless, uh, 
as as I've gotten older, it's become harder to write songs. Yeah, you you have. I don't. I can't even imagine how many songs that you've written. Did you have? Did you write? Were you were you involved in the songwriting process with Bullet of Alter a lot too? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Clay Clay wrote most of the songs, but uh, I, I wrote the music to about four or five songs and uh, and contributed to like maybe half a dozen other songs. I, you know. I had a feeling you wrote the one called Ken Song on uh, Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bull, Bull, and you sang on one of those Bullet of Alta songs too, didn't you? Uh, uh, from from the Bandcamp stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that eventually um, came out on, uh, it was called Blood and Flowers, the song that know. I sang. And uh, that eventually came out on uh, uh, Double double negative the uh, city slang record it did yeah wow i'm sorry i don't i don't you have a lot of you have a lot ken <laughs> yeah well um so you're gonna go make a new record with jay robbins that's pretty exciting because jay's a really cool guy and yeah uh, you must be are you doing that in dc uh in baltimore his studio is like 10 minutes away from where, where ronan and i live Oh yeah, you're down in Baltimore now. Now you were yeah. in Texas for a while, weren't you? Yeah, we lived in Denton, Texas for five years. Making the rounds, man. You're like me. I've lived in seven states, man. I can't stay yeah. in one place for too long, you know? <laughs> Do you think you're going to settle in down there in Baltimore? Uh, good question. We, we like Baltimore a lot, but, you know, we'll, we'll see, see how we feel in a year or two. Um, in a year or two, uh, probably come time to like you know buy something so you know i'd love to live back in massachusetts but it's you know the cost of living there is you know i live an hour from boston i can't even, i used to live in somerville but i can't i can't live there anymore yeah. it's too expensive man my long music career didn't get me a mansion in hollywood hills so yeah. i'm in worcester county which is a complete opposite i guess you would say yeah. um, well, um, thanks for coming on, man. And uh, I wanted to get you on for a while, and I thought I was going to be able to work something out when you were in town, but the pandemic just completely screwed my whole life up, like so many yeah, other people's everybody. lives. Um, you, so you're probably going to make a record and then go on tour. Uh, well, we're going we're going to Europe in May, May and June. Oh, you already got a tour. Yeah. And, uh, you know, probably do a U.S. tour in the fall of uh, 2022. Um, but uh, I, I also got to mention, we just recorded for a week with Rick Hart. And we're, we're going to have a three-song, 12-inch single on Asa Hart's records. What? Yeah. Oh, man, I didn't know that. I love Rick, man. That is great news. Yeah. Oh, we had such a good time doing it. Well, so is it going to be like a, a seven-inch single with three songs? Oh, no, no. It's going to be a 12-inch single. It it's was originally well, going to be a seven inch and uh, Rick's pretty excited about it. So he said, let's make it a 12 inch. Oh, that is really cool to hear. Cause I love Rick. He's one of my favorites, man. Yeah, wow. Rick. You must be psyched about this. Oh, very psyched. I'm, I didn't know, but I mean, does anyone know about that? I did. This is the first yeah. I heard of it. Um, I, I put it out there on Facebook, you know, a few posts and stuff. So people know about it. Nice. Well, congrats on that. I'll have to, I'm looking forward to that. I love everything that comes out on Ace of Hearts. And uh, you don't know what you're doing with the, uh, with the album with Jay yet, do you? Uh, yeah, I mean, that'll be on uh, Boss Tunage Records in the UK and uh, Dead Broke Records uh, in the States. Dead Broke Records, I was wondering what that was. Is that your label? No, no, it's this uh, guy, Mike Bruno. He lives in Long Island, cool, New York, and uh, it's a label that's been around for a little while. Nice. Well, that's good, man. Well, thank you again for coming on. And it's, it's you have such a great career, man. And I, I'm glad to hear you got a lot more going on with it. I I feel like we haven't really even covered the whole thing. <laughs> Is there something I missed that you wanted to mention that I missed? Um. Well. You know, uh, Pat Brady and Pat Leonard passing away. Yeah, 
Well, I mean, when I brought up Bill Whalen and then you said what happened to those guys in Ipswich, man, I was like, oh my God, it's just, and I know you, you know, I know you played Jones Ferry too, right? Yeah, I did Jones Ferry. Records there. Couple records. Yeah, we need two episodes, Ken. <laughs> we okay. can't cover it all with one. <laughs> But uh, thank you very much, man. And uh, good luck welcome. to you. Thanks for having me. And Roan is fantastic. So I'm glad you guys oh. are together, man. I'm a lucky guy. All right, man. Thank you. Uh, Want to give one last shout out uh, yeah. to our new, our new guitar player, Fred. Okay. We have, we have, uh, we're now four piece. Oh, that's great. The other two guys are from uh, Canada, right? The, all three of them are from Montreal. It's a Canadian band now. Yeah. It's a pain. Awesome. Cool, man. All right. Thanks, man. All right. You take care.